Uh, I remember many years ago when my brother Ed and I were just uh, little tykes, my dad decided to take us fishing. And so uh, we lived kind of way out in the country and there was a lake um, near where we lived. And so we had this green metal boat. It was called a John boat. I don't know why, but it was one of those metal boats you would take out and you'd have those feather paddles that you would use. And so we went out fishing. It was around four o'clock and we caught some bass and uh, we were making our way back in and, and the sun was setting. And as we were about, I don't know, about 25 yards off the bank of that small lake, we saw a little head pop up out of the water, kind of moving around. It wasn't a turtle. It was a water moccasin, a snake. And so we'd seen those before, you know, no big deal. A little while, hey, look, there's a water moccasin. Okay, great. And then we start getting and paddling in closer to shore and we see another water moccasin to our, our left. And then we get closer than another one. And then we finally are going to go and put our little metal boat back to where it stays down there by the lake. And we notice that where we normally put the boat there, there were just, I don't know how many snakes. I mean, it was like a Hitchcock or a Tarantino movie, depending upon your age. And it was, it was frightening. I mean, it was crazy. So we didn't bank there. We, we got and, and, and kind of pull the boat to shore to the left of where we normally uh, would, would keep the boat. And, and we got out and we started walking on the banks of this, of this, of this lake and, and, and the sun was going down and it was dark and we didn't know what to do. We were afraid. I mean, can you think of anything worse of being in the dark and snakes are slithering around your feet? Hey. I don't like that. I still don't like snakes. My brothers like snakes. They overcame it, but I don't like snakes. Call me crazy. Call me a chicken. I don't know. I don't like them. They're ugly. They're slimy. They're sneaky. They're slithery. Crud. They're snakes, right? They're snakes. And snakes, you know, like to hang out in the dark. They don't just kind of walk around and slither around the light. They, they, they love the darkness. So my brother and I, as we were there trembling with my father, we're, we're filled with, with fear and wondering what we're going to do next. Um, I, I thought about that as we approach this time of the year and life. I, I thought about snakes and how no matter where you go, no matter where you live, there are always snakes slithering around. If you've worked long enough in your particular profession and field, you know that there are snakes out there, right? In school, junior high, high school, all over social media, snakes are out there. Have you noticed that? Maybe sometimes, maybe even in your family, there's one or two snakes there, right? You, you just don't know, but there are snakes everywhere we go. And when you look at the story of the Bible, uh, snakes were there in the beginning, right? In the garden, we have what we think is a snake that's tempting Adam and Eve. But we all have snakes we have to deal with, contend with. And snakes... They love to hide out. They love the darkness, love the darkness. But thankfully, God the Father always has a plan to deal with the snakes in your life and the darkness in your life as well. Look back, if you would, to the very first book in the Bible, Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 following. Genesis 1 Verse 1, I'm going to start in the book of Genesis and go all the way into Revelation today. We're going through the entire Bible. I'm just kidding. I would hate that. When I, I grew up, you know, obviously going to church, and the preacher would get up there, some guest pastor, and he would take his watch off and put it there. I'm like, ah, oh, this is going to be a long one. Anyway, I don't traffic in long sermons, if you notice that. But let's go back to Genesis 1. Let's see what God's plan is. Was. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be 
lights. And there was light. God saw the light was good and he separated the light from the darkness. So we see in creation, God's very first act, as we talked about a little bit last week, but his very first act, his very first action is to speak light into dark places. God said, let there be light. God compares himself to light. Light is the fastest energy or entity we know in the world. Light goes and travels in a straight line, right? At the speed of light. And it goes on forever and in infinity until it hits its target. Light is also mysterious. Scientists can't figure it out. Some scientists say light is made of waves. Other scientists say light is made of particles. We can't figure out. There's a mystery and a power when it comes to light. But darkness, darkness frustrates us. Darkness can alienate us, but it's light that captivates us. Light illuminates our path so that we can see and know the next step to take. We don't need darkness in our life. We need light. We need God to shine his light in the dark places of our life. But light's fascinating. Think about it. We had, I think, five or six precious babies we dedicated here today. And even when they're, what, four weeks old, six weeks old, the first thing that a little infant will lock on is what? Light. When I was a little boy, a little toddler and stuff, and my brother Ed and I lived in, in those twin beds, we had a night light. Did you have one of those? A night light, so it wouldn't be totally dark when we were trying to go to sleep. And even you hear about life after life. If you ever studied uh, near-death experiences, NDEs, and you talk about people who have been clinically dead, but they're not really dead, and they'll talk about being in a tunnel, and at the end of the tunnel, they talk about being greeted by a being of light. We are attracted to light. We need light. And in the beginning, God spoke light into our world, and God continues to speak light into dark places. What about Christmas time? The very first Christmas. You know, we've kind of cleaned it all up, right? Now it's all neat and clean, nice clean stable, and Mary and Joseph are there, and nice clean robes they got out of the cleaners, and nice clean non-smelling animals, and you know, there wasn't room in the hotel, but boy, that was a great stable, and we've cleaned it all up, and there's a star and magi and gifts away in a manger, blah, blah, blah. Right, we've cleaned it all up. It wasn't that way. At the time of the birth of Christ, there were many snakes slithering around. It was a dark time for the people of Israel. They were, had been invaded, and they had been captured by the Romans. Caesar Augustus was in charge. The Roman Empire stretched all the way from modern-day England to India. That's how much power Caesar Augustus had. Caesar Augustus considered himself to be, listen to this, his title was called the Son of God. And during his reign, when Christ was growing up, he made every single person line up before a magistrate and declare, listen to this, Caesar is Lord. So the Jewish people, Mary and Joseph, lived in fear of Rome. But Rome was nothing compared to King Herod. Herod was a snake of the first order. He was supposedly half Jewish, but he was obsessed with his power. And he finally made a petition to Caesar Augustus, and he wanted a title. And Herod picked for his title King of the Jews. 
Herod drowned his own son-in-law in his pool at a party. Can't make it up. Herod had his wife executed because when he was away in Rome, he feared that she was having an affair, which she was not. He had his wife executed. Herod killed two of his own sons because he was afraid of a power play. They are going to try to take his position as King Herod was overseeing Judea where Christ was born and lived. Caesar Augustus once said, it's better to be Herod's pig than his son's. That's the kind of snake that Herod was. And at the time of Christ's birth, he was so paranoid because he had heard that there may be a new leader, a new Messiah, that he had every firstborn male executed. Caesar Augustus was a snake. Herod was a snake. Mary and Joseph were wandering around in fear, looking for a place to stay. But what happened that first Christmas? It's the same thing that happened at creation. God spoke light into dark places. Shepherds are out tending their flock at night, drinking some bad coffee out of styrofoam cups on the night shift, and boom, God speaks light and gives him a light show and says, I am going to come. I am going to come down to earth and my son, and he will be with you. The wise men were searching and looking, and God gave them a light. He spoke light into that dark place, and that light illuminated their path and guided them to the place where Christ was born. John wrote about it in John chapter 1. He said, the true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. So at Christmas, that very first Christmas, God speaks light into dark places. In the midst of the fear, in the midst of the uncertainty of what's going to happen next to that poor couple, Mary and Joseph, of what's going to happen next to that nation, God speaks light into dark places. Jesus came into the world He said that he was the light of the world. He said he would give light and direction to those who would follow him. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He fed the hungry. He lived a perfect life. But the tide of popular opinion turned against him, and he was crucified. And on that cross, darkness covered the entire earth as he was separated for that moment as he took on the condemnation, the darkness, the sin, and the guilt of the world. And he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And darkness covered the earth. And he was put into a grave, into the darkness of a tomb, and he was there for three days. But on the third day, he came up out of that tomb alive. So at the time of greatest and deepest darkness, God spoke light and life into that dark place, and he came up out of the grave alive on that first Sunday and appeared to Mary Magdalene and to Peter, and to John, and to old doubting Thomas himself, who didn't believe it, to over 500 eyewitnesses, to another mean snake by the name of Saul, he appears to them alive from the dead and says, now, take the light that I've given you, and you go take that light, and you shine that light into the dark places of the world. 
God. Speaks light into dark places. And perhaps today and perhaps during this Christmas season, God is going to speak a word of light into your life. He's going to light a dark spot, a dark place in your life. He doesn't want us to live in the frustration and the alienation of the darkness. He wants to guide us and illuminate our path and give us light and give us hope and give us strength and give us courage. I don't know if you read lately in the last on several years, there's been an, uh, an epidemic of people stealing little baby Jesus is out of manger scenes. I mean, have you heard about those stories? Okay, two people have. Okay, the rest of you, this is news. But seriously, you can read about it in papers throughout the United States. You can just Google it when you go home today, okay? Stealing baby Jesus, okay? So they're, they're, just, they're, they're stealing. And so all these people that have churches and other places where they have nativity scenes have come up with all kinds of ideas on how not to steal Jesus. So some of the baby Jesuses are bolted. I like that. Bolted in the manger and the manger is bolted in the ground. Others have put a GPS, which I think is ingenious, embedded in baby Jesus. Okay, someone steals him, they can go out and, and find him. Okay? I find that interesting. Now, Listen, I, I don't think that the people stealing baby Jesus, I, by the way, I don't know who they are. I, I really don't think it's like the National Atheist Organizations. Let's go steal, but I just don't think that's who's doing it. I mean, it's like if, you know, you look at a, in a bookstore when we used to have them. But when we had bookstores, you can look at surveys. The two most frequently stolen books were the dictionary and the Bible. Which is, again, interesting. So I think the people that are stealing baby Jesus, they just, they probably just want a little bit of Jesus in their house or apartment. I get that. But I would want to tell these folks that are going to all major links to steal baby Jesus, you don't have to steal him. He will come into your life and he can come into your house, your apartment, or wherever you are for free. For free. They just want to steal a little bit of the light. Where God doesn't hide his light from us. God even searches us out in the dark places of our life, in the midst of darkness, in the midst of fear and uncertainty, with snakes slithering in the ground. God speaks his light into our life, and that light helps us to walk with him and to take that next step into out of the darkness and out of fear and out of uncertainty. And now I wish that God would give us a big old searchlight and just shows us everything and a searchlight that goes backwards in time and explains to us why this happened in our past. But God doesn't. He gives us just enough light to take the next step. He gives us the light we need when we need it. So my, my prayer for you, my prayer for myself, is that God, that you would give me that light, that you would speak your light into the dark places of our life, that our path could be illuminated, that we could know the next step to take. His word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Oh, yeah back to the banks of, of that lake when we were fishing with my dad in the darkness and the snakes. Well, my dad, my father had a plan. Here we are, it's dark now, snakes all around us. We're trying to figure out how we're gonna make it home. 
And so my dad says, hey, Ben, jump on my back. I did. Gave the flashlight to Ed Jr., which I thought was risky. So here, <laughs> here's a little light, Ed. You shine the light at our feet and we'll walk slowly and try to find a way through the woods. And so I jumped on his back. Ed started taking that little flashlight and shining it. And the snakes, check this out, started slithering away. And we were able, he was able to kind of tiptoe and make it through the woods. And we saw another light at the top of the hill, which was our home. And as we went through the woods, as we got past the snakes, we followed that light until we arrived safely at home. God gives us <laughs> the right amount of light when we need it to deal with the snakes in the darkness and to lead us step by step all the way home.